For the past 150 years, we have released 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And of that, 27 billion tons in the last year alone. One third of the carbon dioxide dissolves into the oceans, making them more acidic. All animals that have the ability to form a shell are already starting to dissolve. With increasing global temperatures, the glaciers in the Arctic are melting. The largest glaciers are receding at the rate of one kilometer per year. The Arctic ice cap has decreased by 40% in the last 30 years. Some parts of the Greenland glacier are receding at the rate of 30 to 40 meters per day. Sea levels will rise at least three meters by the end of the century. And because of floods, droughts, and the increase of hurricanes, a billion people will have to migrate in the next 100 years. Eighty-seven percent of the world's energy is made by burning fossil fuels that produce carbon dioxide. In 1990, we mined 4.6 billion tons of coal. In 2012, it reached 7.8 billion tons. That is an increase of 60 percent over a period of 22 years. Annual increase of coal production is 3 percent. In 2013, we mined 7,823 million tons of coal, which is 27 times the total weight of humanity or as much as 25,000 Empire State buildings. Meanwhile, we produced 4.4 billion tons of oil, or 3.3 trillion cubic meters of gas. About 13% of the world's energy production does not emit carbon dioxide, and of that, only 2% comprises wind, solar and geothermal power. Solar farms must be located in remote barren areas and in close proximity to a gas line to compensate for when the sun isn't shining, such as at night time or when it's overcast. Similar arguments can be made about wind power, where energy production is limited to when the wind is blowing. 80% of the time, energy is produced by other means, usually with coal and gas. The production of electric power by harnessing the wind or the sun cannot keep up with the global increase in energy demand. What we are doing now is not working. Uranium and thorium are heavy metals that we mine from the earth and use for energy production. We do that by splitting the atom in a chain reaction. Each reaction is a million times more powerful than the chemical energy we get from burning oil or gas. Most of the nuclear power plants we use today are so-called third-generation power plants. Their design, for the most part, is similar and traces back to the 60s. In their core, uranium is bound in ceramic rods. A chain reaction takes place inside them to produce heat. The heat transfers into water that heats up to about 300 degrees centigrade. To be able to reach that amount of heat, the core has to stay at over 70 times the atmospheric pressure. From the core, the water flows into a thermal converter that turns clear water into steam. The superheated steam flows into a turbine that produces electricity. The steam then saturates into water and goes back into circulation. From the beginning of nuclear power in the US, the amount of waste it has produced amounts to approximately 77,000 tons. That waste could all fit into a single football stadium, 3 meters high, and 90% of it can be recycled. 77,000 tons is nothing compared to the 7.8 billion tons of coal that we burn each year. For the coal ash contains radioactive materials in quantities that are greater by orders of magnitude, and all of them get released into the atmosphere. Thorium is an element that is four times more common than natural uranium, and it is a thousand times more common than uranium-235, which is used in most of the nuclear plants today. Thorium is a byproduct in the mining of rare earth metals. The stockpile of thorium in the US alone is 2.6 million tons. That amount would power the planet for 500 years. In the core of a thorium plant, the fuel is mixed with liquid salt. Because the coolant is salt, not water, there is no need to keep the core under pressure, eliminating the risk of explosions. The salt in the core is at 600 degrees Celsius and flows into a heat exchanger to heat up clean salt. The clean salt flows into another heat exchanger and heats up gas. The gas flows into a gas turbine that produces electricity. 
The process spends most of the fuel and the higher operating temperature ensures much greater efficiency. If the plant loses all power and loses the ability to ensure cooling, an ice plug under the core melts. The salt drains into a drain tank that absorbs the heat and the chain reaction stops. The current design allows excess heat from the plant to be used to split hydrogen from water and combining it with carbon from the air, making fuels like methane, ammonia and ether. By a similar process, you could purify seawater. One kilogram of thorium has the same energy density as 13,000 barrels of oil. Thorium power plants will release a thousand times less waste than the classic uranium powered plants. And most of that can be reused for other purposes. You can use plutonium-238 in a powerful battery, like the ones that power the Curiosity rover on Mars. There is also bismuth-213 and molybdenum-99, which are among the most valuable medical isotopes in the battle with cancer, and they exist in extremely limited supply. What if we don't have to think about saving energy? Endless amounts of clean, free energy for all the people of Earth. The battle for natural resources would be unnecessary. The grip that energy companies have on us would be meaningless. We could clean up this planet, turning deserts into forests or green fields. Food production wouldn't be limited, and farmers could have sunlight during the night, all year round and could control the climate. The balance of need and production would shift from a society with endless need and limited resources into a society with limited need and endless resources. It's hard to imagine what it would mean for humanity to have access to limitless amounts of energy because there is so much thorium in the ground and in storage that we will never run out.